chapter 15, the Jewish epistles, Hebrews chapter 6, part 3, a second witness. While there are other difficult passages in Paul's epistle to the Hebrews, preachers have allowed Hebrews chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 6 to cause the greatest divide amongst sincere Bible-believing students. As we have seen, Hebrews chapter 10 does not warn of the loss of salvation, but admonish faith unto salvation. Once this truth is evident, the light of truth found in Hebrews chapter 6 becomes that much clearer. Hebrews 6, 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. Because of the difficulty in understanding the actual teaching of this passage, some believers have relegated the application of this scripture to a future dispensation, Daniel's 70th week. Footnote number one. This passage has been interpreted in four primary ways by the commentators. Number one, that the danger of a Christian losing his salvation is described, a view rejected because of biblical assurances that salvation is a work of God which cannot be reversed. Number two, that the warning is against mere profession of faith short of salvation. Number three, that hypothetically, if a Christian could lose his salvation, there is no provision for repentance, the Ryrie Study Bible, page 843. Number four, that a warning is given of the danger of a Christian moving from a position of true faith and life to the extent of becoming disqualified for service, 1 Corinthians 9.27, and for inheriting millennial glory. Pass this passage's reference to the power of the world to come, like many other verses, likely has a dual fulfillment, a past historical and a future prophetic fulfillment. To them, the passage purportedly teaches the loss and impossibility of restored salvation for those who were once saved. Consider the enormity of the contradiction if Paul wrote such statements that contradict the other truths he had already written in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and even in the book of Hebrews itself. For instance, can Christ forsake those he promised never to forsake? Hebrews 13.5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things ye have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If Paul concluded Hebrews with this glorious certainty, why would any Bible believer falsely claim that Hebrews addressed those who could be forsaken by the Savior? Although these teachings are not limited to this one passage, special attention here should open the door of understanding to the other similar difficult passages. Fortunately, by keeping an open mind and refusing to force the Bible into preconceived systems of study, the pitfalls that have caused so many to stumble can be avoided. Additionally, just because good men or educated men proclaim something as true does not make the proclamation factual. Romans 3, 4. Let the Bible be true. In order to ascertain the context of this text from Hebrews chapter 6, the first thing one should notice is the varying personal pronouns. These pronouns reveal two distinct groups being addressed. The primary group, directly addressed in verses 1 through 3 and verses 9 through 12, and a secondary group, indirectly addressed in verses 4 through 6. The chart shows these pronouns and their usages on page 232. Understanding the identities of these primary and secondary groups, the transition from one to the other and back to the first, serves the key to grasping the truth found herein. The those, they, and them, found in Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, were outside of the group directly addressed by the Apostle Paul. This truth in and of itself should alert the reader to determine Paul's intended audience and purpose. Furthermore, Paul included himself with the group directly addressed by using the self-inclusive pronouns of we and us. The primary group, Hebrews 6.1, let us go on under perfection, verse 3, and this will we do if God permit. Secondary group, Hebrews 6.4, for it is impossible for those, verse 6, if they shall fall away, to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. The distinction in pronouns is critically important for determining the context because Paul did not write, for it is impossible for us, if we shall fall away, etc. This means that Paul and those whom he directly addressed 
in this epistle had an assurance of salvation. After the text in question, verses 4 through 6, the object of the address reverts to the group in the first three verses in which Paul again included himself, verses 9 through 12. The primary group, Hebrews 6, 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So, who are the those referenced in this text, verses 4 through 6? It certainly does not include Paul or followers of Christ, the we in the context. In a first century context, it would refer to Jews familiar with the Lord's crucifixion, but who refused his salvation. They had all the information and truth necessary to be born again, and perhaps had even made some type of profession of faith, but never followed through and believe to the saving of their souls. In other words, they fell away from a mere profession. The next chart has the people groups added in the last row. Footnote number two. An interesting parallel can be drawn from a specific group mentioned in John chapter six who were disciples of the Lord but refused to believe. But there are some of you that believe not. John 6, 44. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walk no more with him. John 6, 66. Why did these disciples stop walking with the Lord and go back? Because they believed not. These disciples were definitely once enlightened and tasted many of the blessings associated to that spiritual enlightenment, but were not believers. The chart on page 234 adds to the previous chart. In addition to the pronouns, it is equally important to note the time frame expressed. Each one of the expressions is in the past tense, who were and who have. Verses 4 and 5 show that those being addressed had already experienced the blessings of hearing the truth. As close as the writing of this epistle was in proximity to the life and ministry of Christ, it is likely that many of these Hebrews had been alive during the earthly ministry of Christ and thus directly aware of his ministry. Those who were not directly aware of Christ's earthly ministry were at least affected by and intimately aware of the apostolic ministry. After all, according to the text, the experience described was one that had occurred in the past. They were once enlightened, but no longer. All Bible believers should agree with this point. Hebrews 6, 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Paul referred to those in the past tense in five different ways. They who were once enlightened and two, have tasted of the heavenly gift and three, were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and four, have tasted the good word of God and five, have tasted the powers of the world to come. At this point, some Bible teachers make a major assumptive leap. With all this knowledge and experience, these men had to have already been saved. Really? But where does the Bible actually say that they were saved? Unfortunately, one leap creates the need for another leap. With all this knowledge and experience, the assumption continues. They lost their salvation. But where does the Bible actually say this? This method of interpretation is clearly out of character for those generally accustomed to a more sound biblical interpretation. In fact, not one time are the words or phrases enlightened or tasted or made partakers ever used as a substitution for the word salvation. However, the significance of each of these expressions can be understood by considering the events taking place in the first century. If one struggles to understand how these words do not necessarily equate to salvation, the Bible contains many examples. One should consider how each of these statements could be applied to Judas Iscariot or any one of the disciples who walked away from the Savior in unbelief in John 6:66. 6, it is obvious that not one of those disciples was saved, and likewise it is obvious that Judas was never saved, John 17:12. Now we consider Hebrews 6, 4 through 6 in detail. These unbelievers were once enlightened. This was certainly true of Judas. This was certainly true of Judas and the unbelieving disciples, 
But it was also true of many Jews alive during and after the time when Jesus came into the world. These Jews were enlightened by the incarnation of Christ, but rejected the light in favor of darkness. Others may have never seen the incarnate Christ, but were enlightened by the preaching of the apostles. They were once enlightened, but no longer enlightened because they chose darkness rather than light. In fact, to be scripturally accurate, consider the enlightenment that every man receives without exception. John 1, 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 3, 19, and this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Footnote number three, this does not mean universal salvation, the general revelation, or even inner illumination. Instead, it means that Christ, as the light, shines on each person, either in salvation or in illuminating him with regard to his sin and coming judgment. The Bible Knowledge Commentary and Exposition of the Scriptures by Dallas Seminary Faculty, page 272. Another similar word to enlighten is the word illuminated found in the book of Hebrews. Just because a man is illuminated, Hebrews 10.32, or enlightened does not mean that he has accepted that illumination or the enlightening and believed to the saving of his soul. The Bible is full of examples of those who heard and understood the truth but ultimately chose to reject it. The light they rejected turned into darkness. This happens today when so-called Bible believers are faced with teachings that contradict their traditional teachings and they cling to the error. John 8.12 then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Number two, these unbelievers taste of the heavenly gift. The word taste can mean to make a trial of or to make an experiment with, thus becoming experiential. David challenged men to taste and see that the Lord is good. This tasting of the Lord was certainly not to be taken literally, but simply inferred the need for an experiential action. Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good, blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Before criticizing this biblical definition set forth above from Scripture, consider the following passage. John 8, verse 51, Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast the devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Obviously, the word taste, footnote number four, some equate the use of taste with another instance in Hebrews that says Jesus tasted death for every man, Hebrews 2, 9, which simply means that he experienced death. Those mentioned in Hebrews tasted or experienced the things addressed in the context. It is a mockery of Scripture to discount what is meant by Christ's tasting of death. It has nothing to do with one's physical senses of tasting or swallowing what is tasted. This is degrading the sacrifice that Christ made on Calvary. Obviously, the word taste bears association to a man's experience. In Psalm 34, 8 above, the appeal was to test or experience the Lord. In John 8, 51, the word taste parallels the word see and speaks of personal experience. Certainly those alive during the ministry of Christ and thereafter tasted of the heavenly gift. By all appearances, that gift was life eternal. According to John, God hath given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, 1 John 5, 11. Yet John later made an even more revealing statement when he said, We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life, 1 John 5, 20. The heavenly gift is eternal life, and that life is in God's Son, but that is not all. The Son is eternal life, 1 John 5, 20. Unfortunately for Judas and the others, they went no further than tasting, seeing, or experiencing the Savior and the life he had within himself, John 5, 26. After all, it was not sufficient to know or experience the gift of God. One must ask for it and receive it by faith, John 4, 10. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Number three, these unbelievers were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. 
Most certainly Judas partook of the Holy Ghost, including the gifts of the apostolic age. Matthew 10, 1. Yet he was a devil, John 6, 70. Of those who turned from the Savior and walked no more with him, it is likely a good number of them, if not all, had also experienced the power of the Holy Ghost in their lives and ministries. Prophetically speaking, the Gospel of Matthew tells of a time when men will cast out devils and they will do many mighty works, but Jesus will testify that he never knew them. Matthew 7, 20. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Is it possible that the Bible contains contradictions and those partakers of the Holy Ghost were saved but eventually forsaken by the Lord? Hebrews 13, 5. No. We have record of the Holy Ghost in the Old Testament coming upon or using men who did not know the Lord, Numbers 24, 2. In fact, the Holy Ghost gave power to some men, regardless of their spiritual condition of those men, to perform signs and wonders to accomplish the greater work of God. Additionally, nowhere does the Bible indicate that anyone who was a partaker of the Holy Ghost or took part in his gifts and did mighty works in Jesus' name subsequently lost his salvation. In fact, Jesus will say of those people who prophesy, cast out devils, and do many wonderful works, I never knew you, never knew you. If he never knew them, they were never known by him or saved. These are not sheep who became goats, an impossibility. The problem originates, at least partially, from a misunderstanding of the person and the work of the Holy Ghost in both Old Testament times and during the earthly ministry of Christ. Two false assumptions have tainted the correct perspective on this doctrinal issue. Number one, the assumption that the Holy Ghost only indwelt a few select people, 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11. And two, the assumption that the Holy Ghost came upon people, indicating assurance of salvation, and then left them, indicating the loss of salvation. First, there's no reason to believe the Spirit of God did not indwell or enter into more people than commonly assumed. According to the testimony given by Pharaoh, Joseph had the Spirit of God dwelling in him, Genesis 41, 38. The Lord himself confirmed that he had filled uh, Bezalel with the Spirit of God, Exodus 31, 3. The Lord said the same of Joshua, albeit with different terminology, in Numbers 27, 18. Nehemiah declared that God's Spirit was in his prophets, Nehemiah 9, 30, a truth confirmed in the New Testament, 1 Peter 1, 10 and 11. Daniel, one of the prophets included in the first Peter passage, was a man in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, Daniel 4, 8. Although we know better than that, Nebuchadnezzar's ignorance of God at that time did not hinder the king from understanding that something greater than Daniel abode within him, giving him the understanding he possessed. This listing is certainly not exhaustive. It is unwise to assume that God was only in those specifically mentioned in Scripture since no scriptural proof exists for such an assumption. Second, there is absolutely no reason to believe that God's Spirit came upon men as an indication of the individual's salvation. For example, the Spirit of God came upon Balaam, Numbers 24, 2, to prophesy concerning the people of God, yet he certainly behaved more like a lost man. Instead, the scriptural truth presented is that God's Spirit came upon a man for a specific task and then left him after the task's completion. For example, the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon Samson to perform various tasks. Judges 14.6, see also Judges 13.25. The fact that the Spirit came upon Samson several times shows that the Spirit departed upon the completion of the particular task. The Spirit then came upon him for the next task. The Spirit of God came upon Saul just before he became king, 1 Samuel 10.10, 10, and then left when Saul's disobedience brought an end to his kingly reign in the eyes of God, 1 Samuel 16.14. To liken this phenomenon to salvation would mean that Saul got saved when he was anointed king and lost salvation when he lost his kingship. 
a private interpretation. Yet Samuel assured Saul, after the spirit had departed, that he and his sons would join Samuel in paradise, indicating that Saul lost the spirit, but did not necessarily lose his salvation. 1 Samuel 28, 19, Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with thee into the hand of the Philistines, and tomorrow shalt thou and thy sons be with me. The Lord also shall deliver the host of Israel into the hand of the Philistines. Simultaneously, God anointed his next king, David, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward, 1 Samuel 16, 13. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he feared the departure of God's Spirit would signify the end of his reign. He was not questioning the loss of his salvation, Psalm 51, 11. All these men partook of the Holy Ghost, but some, like Balaam, were surely not saved. Another grave error occurs when men assume that people could be saved and subsequently lost during the time and ministry of Christ. In order to shed some light on this subject, consider the discourse of Jesus concerning the identity and blessings of his sheep. In John 10:14, Jesus emphatically declared, I know my sheep. John 10:14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. Within the same context, the Lord promised that his sheep would never perish because he gave unto them eternal life, John 10, 27, and 28. Every Bible believer that believes once saved, always saved, should just as readily believe once a sheep, always a sheep in Jesus' day. If we consistently define the phrase eternal life to mean a life that cannot be taken away, thus eternal for the church age saint, we certainly should not be guilty of altering this meaning for those who lived in the times of Christ's ministry. The men of Hebrews chapter 6 who were said to be partakers of the Holy Ghost were not Christ's sheep. Like many others during the time of Christ, they took part in the benefits of the Holy Ghost. They may even have done as they were recorded in Luke 6.46 and declared Jesus to be the Lord. Luke 6.46, and why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Those mentioned in Luke chapter 6 claim that they did many mighty works in Jesus' name. They even called out to Jesus, Lord, Lord, but the Lord rebuked them because they failed to do what he told them to do. In spite of all these good works, they missed God's will. It is not as though God's will was hidden from them, for Jesus stated it repeatedly. They were to believe on him. John 6:40. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Those who simply believed on Jesus had everlasting life, and those who did not believe on him were told that Jesus never knew them. He never knew them, despite all the wonderful works they performed, and perhaps even furthered by the Holy Ghost. John's second epistle offers a poignant example of what it means to be a partaker. Second John 10. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. By simply bidding God's speed to somebody who is teaching false doctrine, a man becomes a partaker or partner of the teacher's evil deeds. It insinuates that you are yoking up with the teacher to promote his false teachings, although you may not believe or espouse the actual doctrines he promotes. Simply put, partake, partakers, and partaking mean taking part, which is equivalent to participating. On the somewhat positive note, experiencing fiery trials makes men partakers of Christ's suffering, although the men never literally suffered with Christ. 1 Peter 4.12 Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. Lastly, on this issue of partaking, those not separating from Babylon will be partakers of the sins of Babylon. Revelation 18.4 And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. The important thing to note is that partaking of the Holy Ghost does not infer being indwelt by him. 
it infers association with the works, like a partaker of Christ's suffering or partaker of Babylon's sins. Those in Matthew chapter 7, like Judas Iscariot, were partakers of the Holy Ghost through the deeds they performed, but were never saved. After all, Judas, mentioned by name, was ordained, sent forth to preach with the power to heal the sick and cast out devils. Judas had this power because he was a partaker of the Holy Ghost, yet he was never saved, John seventeen twelve, Mark three fourteen, And he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils, verse 19, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Number four, these unbelievers tasted the good word of God. Once again, Judas and the others like him made trial of or experienced with the word of God when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. These unbelievers tasted the good word of God. Once again, Judas and the others like him made trial of or experimented with the word of God when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke. Yet the word did not take root in their hearts because it was not received with faith. The parable of the sower mentioned those who had the word sown in their hearts, but the ground remained infertile. Mark 4.15 And these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Number five, these unbelievers tasted the powers of the world to come. Judas and the others watched as Christ demonstrated his authority over the devils, Mark 1, 27. And they were all amazed inasmuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. The people knew that only God's power could spoil the strong man's house, Matthew twelve twenty nine. They watched as the Lord gave sight to the blind. He raised the dead. He fed the multitudes, and he set the captives free. Not all those who witnessed these powers came to a saving knowledge of the Savior. In fact, the Bible says the Pharisees attributed Christ's powers to Beelzebub, Matthew twelve twenty four. And when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. While these statements certainly fit the likes of Judas Iscariot and serve to adequately describe the unbelieving disciples that departed from the Savior, they likely also apply to the unbelieving Jews as a whole. This description applies to the Jews and their unique association with God and the truth of God throughout time. After all, no nation had God so near to them as the nation of Israel, and yet they hardened their hearts in unbelief and crucified the Lord of glory. Since the first century, this nation has consistently rejected the Savior. Up to this point, each one of these elements in Hebrews chapter 6 was in the past tense. Were enlightened, have tasted, were made partakers. But verse 6 reverts to the present tense. In other words, it reveals the sinner's present heart condition and resulting behavior. Hebrews 6.6, 6, they crucify, present tense, they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Much like the passage in Hebrews chapter 10, Christ was the only answer for man's sin. If the unbelieving Jew would not humble himself, repent of his sin, and trust Christ as his Savior, he could make sacrifices every day but to no avail. The law, the sacrifices, the priesthood, and the temple could offer no satisfaction for sin, none whatsoever. After all, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins, Hebrews 10.4. By the time Hebrews was penned, Jesus had already been literally and physically crucified on the cross. Those addressed were being warned not to re-crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh, figuratively. Those with this sort of debased heart condition simply cannot be rescued in their present condition. It is impossible, nor can they be delivered from sin, such a debased state. It is impossible. Only through the exercise of faith in the finished work of Christ, which does not happen in a rebel's heart, is there any hope of salvation. The passage continues by contrasting two groups, one that received the truth reflected by the herbs, and one that rejected it reflected by those with the thorns and briars. Hebrews 6, 7, For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. 
but that which beareth thorns and briars rejected nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. The unbelieving Jews were likened to that which bore thorns and briars and were nigh unto cursing. Those who reject Jesus Christ were and are rejected by God. Their end is to be burned. Yet this was not the expectation of Paul's primary intended audience. Of them, Paul said, Hebrews 6, 9, But, beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Hebrews chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 6 have always been quite problematic for the Bible believer who knows to take the Bible literally. We simply cannot contradict the clear teaching of eternal security or better yet eternal life found within the book of Hebrews, i.e. Hebrews 13.5, with passages found within the same epistle. Yet some men have become so entrenched in a belief system that God himself could not convince them of the error of their ways. The choice is always clear. Believe the Bible and reject the error by giving Christ the preeminence. This is the end of chapter 15.